Good morning, everybody. Uh, we will call to order this meeting um, Wednesday, March 15, 2023. Um, is there someone that can make a motion to approve the minute, minutes from the last meeting? I, can I move as secretary? Sure. Oh, <laughs> to approve. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise I can make a motion to approve the meeting, the minutes from the last meeting. If somebody wants to um, second that, or is there any, um, does anybody have any comments or questions? In the chat, there was uh, Brenda second. Oh, okay. I didn't even realize. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank sure. you so yeah. much. All right. So those minutes have been approved. Um, just wondering if there's any additions to the agenda. Does anybody have any things, anything to add that we can um, add to the agenda today? Okay. Doesn't look like anybody at this time has anything additional. And, and so right now we are calling for a chair elect, which I had put um, vice chair, but it's actually chair elect. So if is there anybody that would be willing to step forward or think about it? Otherwise, Rachel's going to come <laughs> give you a phone call. <laughs> Otherwise, it's a great it's a great opportunity to serve. Um, I've learned a lot. It was a great experience, and I really appreciate it. Um, so, with that, we can. I don't know if there's any. Does um, Victoria? Do you have anything to add? Um, it's it's not difficult and again it's it's a learning experience and if you haven't um chaired or um, been on the in officer in one of the ccs um, groups it's it's interesting and it's an interesting way to get to know um, more people in your group in the consortium yeah thanks victoria sure and kelly yeah, yeah. kelly did you have anything to share this morning <laughs> Thank you. All right. So then I will turn it over to um, Rachel for staff reports. One moment. The full text of my staff report is available in the packet. Today, I'll just summarize it. DCS will not be upgrading the production server until it can be updated with version 7.4 in the spring. We should be able to update the training server to 7.4 by the end of March. Training was held on bibliographic records yesterday. It included deduplication. The recording is online and some of you may be interested in learning about the bibliographic records in LEAP. The Polaris 7.4 update will include the capability for receiving poly segments in LEAP. I know I've had some questions about that, so that will be coming soon. And I will um, schedule training for that as soon as I can. I received a number of questions regarding the bibs with tag 970 without a subfield 9 report. 
I've created a web page explaining the web report. This includes frequently asked questions and instructions for correcting the issue. The link is in the packet. I also forgot to include the results of that poll for our meeting location in the packet. Most people wanted at least one person, one in-person meeting. This will be in Lincolnshire. So we will have one in-person meeting in Lincolnshire and one virtual meeting next year. Okay. Thanks, Rachel. Um, and then new business, I'm going to um, turn it over to Rachel for canceled publications. One moment, I'll share my screen. Can everyone see my PowerPoint? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah. Due to a lack of response by some libraries when canceled publications are announced, CCS staff have been asked to play a stronger role as the main point of contact for the canceled publication procedures. I've drafted a new procedure. The procedure begins with acquisition staff emailing the help desk to let us know that a publication has been canceled. CCS staff will then add the publication canceled note to 245 field, uncheck the display and pack settings of the item and bib record, add the title to the record set, and email acquisitions and pass listservs to announce the publication has been canceled. So this email will state that staff need to delete the item records and cancel holds within three weeks. Each library will contact the designated department to request that the holds are canceled. If a library does not delete the items and cancel holds after three weeks, CCS will do so for the library without contacting the patron. Uh, is a setting that could potentially be turned on to automatically send notices to patrons that the holds are canceled, but we have had problems with that sending out holds when um, hold maintenance is being done, like if it's moved from the item record to the bib record. So we've turned that off for most libraries. I know there's one library that opted to still have that on, but for now it's um, off for all the other libraries. Are there any suggestions on improving this process or any objections to using this new um, procedure? No objections, but just a note that puts a lot of onus on CCS, but I can see that that's the only maybe way to get this out. So. Agreed. Yeah, I, I agree, Rachel. I think this will be really helpful. Um, I yeah, I think this will be this looks like a good procedure to me. Thank you. Would you want to um, actually vote on this, or are you okay with just a, a accepting it as it is? say accepting it as, as it is because it's a very good idea you know to get the you know get that information in there because I know a lot of times now multiple emails go out about things like this and Rachel's reminding people to go in and um, take care of it so this is probably a good idea yeah maybe we could just ask if there's any objections so far I'm seeing in the chat that right. people are yeah, accepting it. Accepting, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it's great to have kind of a leadership in this. So I think this is going to be very helpful. Um, yeah, everybody's so far saying it's good. All right, we'll accept it as it is done. Thank you so much, Rachel. Okay. 
Okay. Okay, and the other thing is, um, how do libraries handle cleaning up the holds when individual multi-volume records are merged with the seat, the SAT record, and that slay? Um, hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning everyone. Um, the reason I brought this up is sometime when um, a new this mostly applies to like the graphic novels, of course, the with the multi-volume uh, records. So I guess my question is sometimes I do see preliminary records for new volumes and their holds on this preliminary record. So my question is to the libraries, um, how do you guys move those holds over to the multi-volume bit records? Like, is that at the cataloging? And if they do that, does how do they know to put it, the right holds, like for the right volume? Mm -hmm. And I believe for us, it's our cataloger that, that um, handles it and maybe contacts the library where the hold is, um, you know, on that particular graphic novel and letting that library handle their holds. And I believe that's how we handle it. Our catalogers handle it as well. And it's the person who catalogs that item. Right. Yeah. So when do you does do you know if the cataloger actually merged then the preliminary record? I think they do here at Indian Trails. So when it gets merged, Rachel, does that mean the hold gets moved over to the multi-volume? And also does that mean those holes that gets merged into that multi-volume? set rec uh, bit record do those those patron get the right book the holds do get merged and they get placed on the bibliographic record so they would not get placed on the correct volume unless you manually redo the hold so you'd have to cancel the hold and then uh, manually add the hold again so it's um ISBN that you assigned to the right volume Right. Okay. In the chat, it's saying that catalogers do the merging. When there are questions regarding holds, we ask our public service uh, services staff for help. Um, the catalogers handle any merging. Yeah. With us, um, we try to put the volume number so that when the patron is placing a hold, they they are they're able to see which volume they want. Um, you know, Victoria said uh, the ISBN get the right ISBN for the right volume number. Um, sometimes it can smith, but we really try to put the volume in there so that they get their what they want. You know, the right volume. So. Does that help, Lay? I do, but sometimes I, I just kind of feel like there's too many preliminary record out there for a new volume, and which can cause confusions. Like it's, uh, for example, um, Jojo Bazaar, like it has a new volume that's coming out, like a volume 20. And then there's like preliminary records out there when it can just be and put it into the, you know, correct records. I mean, is that even something possible? Lay, this is Kathy at the McHenry Public Library District. Uh -huh. When we import our PDRs for the graphic novels for anything where we're expecting 
to need a multi-volume record. We cannot just import onto that multi-volume record because it will not capture the correct ISBN when we do the EDI ordering. So that's why we're creating so many PDRs for those volumes. At my library, we're not expecting acquisition staff to be able to make the same judgment calls that our catalogers do. So we do not ask acquisition staff to handle any merging. Whenever possible, my acquisitions associate is supposed to report those um, graphic novel, manga, mm -hmm. uh, PDRs to the catalogers so that those merges can be taken care of as soon as possible. It doesn't always happen. It's not perfect. But there's there's reasons why it is the way it is, and I don't know if the onus should be on the individual library to clean up after themselves. At what point do we set this in and say, you know, if you're doing this, we need to have a means to address this because we're trying to address ours before we start getting holds on the items. And we're trying to keep things simple for our patrons when they're searching so that they don't have to find the multi-volume record, and then the individual record for the forthcoming books that they want to be on hold for. So, you know, these are just some things to think about. Okay. I, I guess from my standpoint, because I, I once, um, when I order and I see that the title is on a multi Bit record. I do have the authorization here to actually add to the multi-volume uh, records and put in the ISBN into that. But it's just sometimes when I'm importing, it gets loaded into that um, preliminary data record. Uh, bit. But no, I mean, I understand that each library has its own um, individual workflow and all that, but I was just trying to see if somehow we can have a standard, I guess, but if not, then that's fine. Mm -hmm. Well, I know at Indian Trails, the, um, the cataloger that does all of our graphic novels, as an example, she wants the book in hand before she, you know, like merges a record or, you know, um, adds to a current record. She wants to make sure that it's going to the right um, place before she just, you know, assumes that it's part of that series because sometimes things change when the item comes in. It's not necessarily part of that series, even though it said it was. So she doesn't do any merging until she actually has the book in front of her and she takes care of it from there. Right. Okay. No, it's just that also because when our patrons see those preliminary records out there, they'll put a hold on that versus putting it on the multi-volume bit record. And then that's when, you know, if we're not looking at the PDR records, the holds might just sit out there for our patrons versus like they could have gotten part of the book, you know, already because it's... Uh, There's several comments in the chat. Brenda commented that they put um, item level holds on those items and not bib level holds. Um, and Jamie asks if call number volumes are added on the PDR items before merging onto the multi-volume, would holds stay on that volume? Um, no, uh, the call number would not affect like how the holds are automatically merged. If the hold was placed on the bibliographic record, it will move to the new bibliographic record. But I think if it was placed on the item record, the hold would stay with the item. Um, Cassie asks you, Leigh, if you do EDI ordering. Uh, no, I'm, we don't do EDI.
Thank you so much for uh, Kathy and Leigh, um, Kelly. Thank you, Rachel. Um, is there anything else? Does anybody have any other comments on that? Otherwise, we can go on to how to stack did, man. Oh, sorry, I just wanted. Did, did we get it uh, solidified? Like, did we get the answers on who, if anybody is um, canceling or doing the whole, um, changing the holds, mm. and who they notify? It? I got some of the answers in here. Um, okay. That was that was the original question about about the holds. So did we get that question answered satisfactorily? I I think that it answers like mostly a, it goes goes down to the cataloging department to handle okay. the holds. So, but yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Um, okay, and the next question is, how do staff manage locked records when importing files? And I've got Rachel and um, Womack, um, M. Womack, so I'll turn it over to you guys. I don't think Matt um, is here today. He didn't respond to my question, okay. um, but um, We've had several people ask recently about uh, managing locked records. We've had some issues with that. So um, the main question is if you um, have had a lot of locked records lately, how have you been managing that when you're importing your on order record files? Um, what happens here? I, what I do is when I'm importing, I set the default price to a penny. And so that way, since it wouldn't, I wouldn't properly fill in the list price when I'm importing in, I can see that it's a penny and then I manually change the PO line item to the correct fund and item types and all that. And then I, I'll go in and see if I can put in the 970 myself, if it's unlocked at some point, just for checking against Ingram's uh, auto detect feature for uh, duplicate for duplicates or previously on order items and I can change that and for because you have to enter in a fund I uh, have an alert fund that's just basically there for if I see that fund I know that it didn't properly import and then that's another sign for me to change it so is your alert default fund um set up just um as a fund that's like not as part of a hierarchy or do yeah, you have like one set up for both like adult and youth no it just says cpq alert and there's no money attached to it it's not a, under a parent fund it's just a fund that just it has nothing there if, if i try to assign something to it it'll let me know that there's nothing there but it's just a placeholder to, to warn me because otherwise if you do it to another fund like if I'm importing all J fiction, if I select that at the fund, then it doesn't actually warn me of, of anything. It's, I have to rely on it being the right, I mean, being a penny instead of the right list price. It's just a second safety measure to make sure that I notice. That's a good idea. Hmm. Thanks, Brad. Um, that is great. Okay. So Any I have a question with that. The problem, the problem that we've had in the past um, that we've contacted Rachel about is having files locked and we're importing um, our, not our brief mark records, but our, you know, enriched EDI, where it's, it's not um, overlaying because the record is open somewhere else. And so it's not importing our, you know, ISBNs and our, all of that bad stuff. So can, can we address that? Um, well, uh, Evanston and Indian Trails are the only two libraries that have enriched EDI. And I know Evanston has had some problems with that too. Um, I think that um, one thing I've noticed is that the easiest way to identify those 
issues is to look at the import profile and the import profile tells you when the record has been locked. Okay. Um, I don't think there's an easy way to identify it using defaults. I think you just have to look in the import profile. So once if once that happens and it's not importing everything in, um, what is the resolution of that? Like, what do we have to do? To, do we just have to then manually do it? Or is there a way to re-import so that it fills in all those gaps? Um, I think technically what you could do is uh, use Mark Edit software to pull out the bibliographic records to create a separate file of the ones that have been locked and then try to re-import those. Okay. All right, we'll talk to you about that separately then. Yes. Somebody's saying they're unfamiliar with locked records. So I'm afraid there's not much I can add here. I can uh, create a document with instructions on how to uh, find those records in Mark Edit, but I'll need a, a sample file of records from someone so I can make pictures, um, screenshots for the instructions. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. And a and then demonstration, invoice summary report for distributed um, charges, Rachel. Yeah, one second. Sure. Can you see my presentation screen? Yes. All right. Um, so if you do use distributed charges, you may find it useful to create an invoice summary report in Simply Reports. Distributed charges can be cataloging services or shipping charges or other charges that you add to the invoice by opening up the tools dropdown menu clicking on distribute and then clicking on charges. The dialog box that you'll see on the screen opens up and you can select whether it's cataloging services, shipping or other charges. And then you would typically add that to existing charges. And then it gets distributed throughout the line items. These charges are added to that charges tab of the line item. So this image shows cataloging and a sh shipping credit. So this slide lists the settings that I recommend using for the creation of the report and simply reports that you can refer to. I've also included it on a web page uh, for the acquisitions reports in simply reports. Although uh, some reports have been glitchy, this is one of the reports that is accurate in Simply Reports. So I'm now going to uh, switch screens. I have to shop, stop sharing this for a moment. And um, we'll navigate to Simply Reports in my browser so I can review this with you. All right, um, if you're unfamiliar with using invoice reports in Simply Reports, so, you, so you'd click on the Invoices tab, and then you'll have to click on the second tab for Invoice Summary Reports. All of the data that can be output is listed in this Report Output column section. So I'm going to add the fiscal year name to the report. And then I'll click on fund name. And then 
I'll scroll down to the sum segment section. And we'll add the sum segment cataloging service charges and the sum segment shipping charges the report. And then for the filters, all you need to do is select the correct fiscal year. So you'll have to select a specific status of open, closed, or encumbrance is closed. I'll use the closed fiscal year. And then I'll just select um, this one from Gray's Lake for an example. Press submit. The default is to allow you to download an Excel file. So it's still loading. Um, as then you can see the preview of what this report would look like. It adds up the total of the um, charges for the fiscal year in the report, and you can just check the box to download the report and click download to download your Excel file. Are there any questions? Okay, thank you so much, Rachel. Um, and the reminders, fiscal year rollover and uh, deduplicate PDRs, Rachel. All right, one moment. All right, um, since the fiscal year rollover only happens once a year, um, I'll be reviewing that process with you yearly. Um, as I have in the past, the rollover process transitions the acquisitions module from your current fiscal year to a new fiscal year. It automatically generates a new fiscal year structure identical to that of your current fiscal year and sets your previous fiscal year to the status that will prevent the new orders from being placed in it. Depending on the type of rollover you choose, the status of the closed fiscal year will say closed or encumbrances closed. There are three options to choose from for the fiscal year rollover. There's the run fiscal year rollover utility and rollover the free balance, run fiscal year rollover utility and zero out the free balance, or replicate the fiscal year hierarchy. Most libraries choose the option to zero out the free balance, but some are replicating the fiscal year hierarchy. Running the fiscal year rollover utility creates a new fiscal year with a fund structure identical to that of the current fiscal year. If the encumbrances are rolled over, the process unlinks certain records connected to uninvoiced purchase orders from the old funds and relinks them to the corresponding funds in the new fiscal year. This includes pending POs, polys on pending purchase orders, open invoices and PO templates. So when you choose to roll over the encumbrances, the encumbered amounts are disencumbered in the old fiscal year and roll over to the new one. This is recorded in the fund history and the fund records. Then the utility closes all funds from the current fiscal year so that they won't be available for future orders. When running the fiscal year utility and rolling over the encumbrances, there are two options to choose from. The free balance can either be rolled over with the encumbrances or be zeroed out. So all funds start with a $0 free balance. So I haven't heard of any libraries rolling over the free balance. Everyone zeroes them out. Several libraries choose to replicate the fiscal year hierarchy. This creates a new fiscal year with a fund structure identical to that of the current fiscal year, but does not roll over encumbrances or linked records. The beginning free balance is $0, and the status is updated to encumbrances closed. In this state, staff can still receive and expend purchase order line items that were encumbered prior to that utility being run in that fiscal year they were ordered in. Once all outstanding orders have been received and invoiced, you can contact CCS staff to close the previous fiscal year. There are a number of tasks that can help you to prepare for the rollover. 
you can run the outstanding orders report. This helps identify which purchase orders will be rolled over or will remain attached to the previous fiscal year. It is important to release or delete pending purchase orders. You should also pay open invoices so that money is expended from the correct fiscal year and apply known credits to paid invoices. You can also ask for me to run the pre-processing report. This shows the current state of the fund balances to be rolled over. It is also possible to schedule a test rollover and training, but this data will not be current since it was last updated in January. So now is a great time of the year to review the instructions for correcting uninvoiced purchase orders. Even when purchase orders are received, they need to be properly linked to an invoice before the fiscal year rollover. If they are not linked to the invoices, the purchase orders will roll over to the next fiscal year. This slide lists a number of SQL queries that are helpful to run on the purchase order line item find tool. There is the received polys, not invoiced query on the purchase orders find tool. There is POs, not canceled or closed, and POs, not invoiced. And on the invoices find tool, there's invoices not paid or closed. If you have any questions about these queries, please let me know. CCS staff will complete the rollover early in the morning before 7 a.m. when no other staff are using the database. We will send an email to the acquisitions listserv to let everyone know about the upcoming rollover and send an all clear when it's safe to resume using the acquisitions module. CCS will rename your new fiscal year, but Library staff will add or delete new funds as needed and allocate dollar amounts to the funds. Several libraries have become interested in purging old purchase orders and invoices. After a fiscal year rollover, you may request CCS to delete old purchase orders and invoices, Polaris purges records that were created before a specific date. So you could request the records to be purged if they were created more than a year ago or more than two years ago, as an example. Um, CCS staff have to schedule the process. It runs around midnight. There is one caveat that you should be aware of. Polaris will retain the purchase orders if a line item was paid after the date, but the invoices will be deleted. So when this happens, it looks like the purchase orders that had been paid in the period that should be purged were received but not invoiced, and the line items that were paid after were received and invoiced. However, this uh, purchase order would then be able to be purged in the next year. Or if you'd like to change the purge date, we'd be able to change the purge date to purge that invoice, uh, I mean, purge those purchase orders and invoices. So more information on this um, issue, um, as well as a specific ASN issue um, for those that do use ASN, are available on the CCS website on the page on the fiscal year rollover. Are there any questions on the fiscal year rollover process? Um, Rachel, this is like, I'm yes. remind me again, how far in advance do you need to know? The fiscal rollover. Um, a month in advance would be good, I think, uh, since we have the rollover coming up for many libraries at a time, um, it would be good to schedule those um, as early as possible. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Rachel. And then deduplicate um, PDRs. Rachel, did you want? Uh, to yes. Um, we do regularly receive complaints about too many PDRs um, that are causing problems with um, the deduplication process. 
when there is more than one duplicate PDR. Uh, Polaris does not know how to deduplicate any incoming records. Um, so please do try to um, watch for those duplicates and um, deduplicate the PDRs if you can. I know at some libraries, the uh, acquisition staff um, is not required to do so, um, but it's a good topic to do some um, training on if that's the case, um, because it, it is very helpful if you can deduplicate those PDRs um, so that it does not cause problems when importing new vendor records. Are there any questions on that at this time? Thanks, Rachel. And then library showcase, I wasn't sure. Avoiding unauthorized versions of movies and television on TV, DVD. Um, Aaron and Heather. Good morning. Good morning. My camera is so low. Um, good morning. I'm Heather Campbell. I'm the cataloger at Lake Villa. Um, and we have recently had some um, library wide meetings about how things move through the library with acquisitions and cataloging and some concerns with um, possible bootleg DVDs in the CCS database came up and uh, my colleague Karen has done some research into that. So she's going to share with us um, some tips and information today. Um, so I'm a selector in our de adult department and was really just trying to fill holds for our patrons who wanted things and realized that some things were just not out there and there's a reason for that. They're just not available. And so I've got um, some things to a presentation for you. So I'll try to share that. Where's that? And it always goes faster in practice. All right, can you see the... Okay, here we go. So um, I always recommend just looking on Google for your titles. Uh, I think a problem is more prevalent with television, but here's some uh, films uh, here, just a general entry here for a recent film. And you see at the top, they've got all the information right there, very easily um, accessible. And also it's on the side there where you can see it. And then I also look at Wikipedia for some more information about uh, the titles that I'm searching for. I look for the release information. And for this one, Wikipedia's got a nice little blurb there about how this was released on DVD and the dates. Um, popular television series, Stranger Things. Um, again, we have all the information up top from Google, uh, when it was done, how many seasons it is, and uh, the production. And now, Stranger Things was a fun one because when it was released, it was not uh, done to our, went through our vendors. It was uh, at Target. I had a colleague who actually went to Target and bought those for our library. Uh, but notice it only mentions the first two seasons and not seasons three and four. And I've had people look for seasons three and four, and they are simply not available on DVD at this point because Netflix will make more money from a subscription. And then Grace and Frankie was the TV series that kind of got me started on all this. We had two seasons and people wanted more because as you can see, it runs for seven. But if I look at Wikipedia and I just sort of pulled this up here, um, only the two seasons um, have been released and there's nothing out there. Um, but I was finding some in CCS, people were asking for uh, the subsequent seasons and I've got season two and three here. And if you notice, UPC codes for them are identical. And that was kind of my first tip off that um, this is gonna be hard to order. Uh, we order from Baker and Taylor and Midwest Tape. Uh, here's my Baker and Taylor screen and only two seasons, uh, yeah. the ones that we have. Uh, Midwest Tape, same thing. You can get two seasons, yeah. but nothing on that. Um, and so I do look at several <laughs> websites for where to uh, find what's available. And so here's an example of one. This is just new DVD release date. Very helpful um, website. And then we've got uh, a second one. 
Uh, and so I just would recommend these to anybody who is uh, purchasing for your libraries. Um, and then video ETA. And same thing. There's two available. And so go back to Amazon. That's our standby when I can't find anything. Here's one that supposedly has um, for, for six seasons. But if you notice where it's uh, sourced from, this is not from Amazon itself. It's a third party. And so chances are this is an unauthorized copy. And then this is one that Heather sent me and uh, maybe your catalogers might be on the lookout for something like this. If you notice that middle um, row, they couldn't even write out the word season. So this is really very poor quality production and a, a tip off. So that something actually makes it to your library, this probably isn't a quality product for your patrons. Mm -hmm. um, one other issue is we have seasons that have run for many seasons, Grey's Anatomy, 19 seasons, but um, it's only on uh, Hulu at this point. So when they produced it, they released 13 seasons to DVD, but guess what? The other ones are not there. So I have people asking for seasons 14, 15, can't find it. It's not out there. And so unlike years past when everything was just made by two or three or five companies or uh, 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 broadcast networks, and then immediately released after a certain period of time, that's not the case anymore. And there's just an explosion of production companies and streaming platforms and they don't always put it out there on um, DVD or Blu-ray for our patrons. Um, some things are out there, some aren't. Uh, if I consider Netflix, you can get uh, The Crown on DVD, but you can't get Bridgerton. So it's uh, really uh, haphazard there. Some things like last year's Academy Award Best Picture, Coda, has not been released to DVD because that's an Apple product. Um, I think I left this one for, uh, for Heather and um, catalogers and acquisitions people and just some ideas there. Yeah, I found some tips uh, when you're actually handling an item in hand, if it's got a flimsy case, um, usually uh, professionally printed DVDs have that little seal on the top that says DVD. Um, if the, as Karen mentioned, if the UPC is a duplicate to a different season, or if you can't find any results when you're searching for the UPC, a lack of records in WorldCat might tip you off that it, it's not um, something that is actually available. Um, poor quality labels or poor quality image when it's viewed. And then oftentimes there'll be the FBI anti-piracy warning at the beginning of, of uh, you know, a legitimate DVD or Blu-ray. Well, it's a, it can be a tricky thing here. Um, I've got our contact information here. Kid at Crystal Lake provided some helpful tips and also said, please feel free to reach out. But um, that was pretty much what we had. Oh, thank you so much, Karen and Heather. That was really, really helpful. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Very much. Um, is there any questions or anybody have any questions for Karen and Heather? Um, okay. Um, and is there any announcements or anything different changing at your library? <laughs> anything? exciting. <laughs> okay, well, I think unless there's... Oh, sorry. Go Brian ahead. Brian Renovations at, um, continue at uh, ELA. Oh, got it. Okay. Oh, McHenry will be hiring a part-time cataloger. Brenda, what kind of renovations are, what department is getting the renovations? She, Brenda doesn't have um, audio. Oh, okay. oh, major renovations for staff areas. Oh, great. Congratulations, <laughs> that's great. Good, good, good. 
All right. It's been loud and smelly, but exciting. <laughs> when it's done, you'll appreciate it, right? <laughs> Renovations are no fun. But when it's over, that yeah, that's great. Congrats. I know we went through that too with Huntley, and we are so happy, so grateful. Every day I come in the building, I still can't believe this is our library. <laughs> we feel extremely lucky. So thank you so much. Um, okay, with that, we can adjourn the meeting unless there's something else that somebody else would like to add. Otherwise, we will adjourn the meeting and we will see what happens September 20th. Um, if that's uh, on Zoom or if that would be in person, right, Rachel? Depending, huh? That one might yes. be on Zoom. Um, well, if you'd like the first meeting to be in Lincolnshire, we can arrange that. Okay. That's great. Thank you so much, everybody. And Rachel, thank you. And Victoria and uh, Kelly, good luck. <laughs> I've enjoyed it. Thank you so much for letting me do this. It's great. Keep, com keep coming on, though. Don't don't disappear just because you're not the chair. Right. Thank you. I will. We will. We'll come back for sure. Thank you. Thank you.